It's 2012, just days after Thanksgiving. The Pennsylvania fall is starting to turn to winter, signaling the start of buck season. Fawn Mountain has spent the day with her girlfriend Heather at Heather's parents' home in East Freedom, preparing their butcher shop for hunting season. Heather's brother Mike and his girlfriend Stephanie also help clean the shop by washing it down with bleach and sterilizing tools. Once finished, they all drink some beer before heading home together, since the couples are neighbors in a Claysburg trailer park. Before calling it a night, Heather stops at Mike's house to help him bring something inside. Fawn waits in the car and talks to Mike's girlfriend, Stephanie. And she said, oh, I'm gonna go home, watch some scary movies. She loves scary movies. And that was the last I've seen her. Growing up, friends and family described Fawn as friendly, easygoing. I liked her. She was very nice and very sweet. She got along with basically everyone. The kind of person that goes out of her way for people. Fawn was an outgoing girl. She would do anything for anybody. Especially her family. We had our ups and downs, but she was a good sister to me. Fawn was particularly close to her cousin Bridget growing up and helped her raise a young family. I had my daughter when I was 16. Fawn and I were already close to begin with, but we got uh, even more close because she was just, she just grow, grew so attached to my daughter. But childhood wasn't easy for her. She's been exposed to a lot of sexual abuse. And her family says she struggled with love because of that abuse. At a young age, Fawn had two children during a relationship that got physically violent. Both children were taken away. She had had a, a history of abusive relationships, so she just fell right back into another one. A third child, a daughter named Caden, came stillborn a few years later. Fawn found comfort in keeping Caden's ashes close and soon looked at love differently. She had never even been with a woman. Fawn first met Heather Dibert back in 2009 in an Altoona nightclub called The Island. Friends and family close to the pair called the connection instant, and their relationship developed fast. She said to me, Mom, she said, can we go for a walk? And I was like, okay, we'll go for a walk. So we went for a walk. And she said, Mom, I said, what? She said, Heather wants me to move to Claysburg with her. Although Fawn appeared to be sold on her feelings, others weren't so sure, especially her mom, Dorothy, who thinks Fawn was holding something back. I'm afraid if I go with Heather to Claysburg to live, she said, I'm never coming back to Altoona, which she was right. She never came back to Altoona. Stephanie Clark, who used to be Heather's brother's girlfriend and still remains close to Fawn's family today, describes Heather as temperamental and even possessive, something she says Heather brought into her relationship with Fawn. Heather worked at several different, she had several different jobs. She couldn't keep a job because she would make Fawn go to work with her and sit in the car all day. And at other times. She made her stay at home, but she had all calls going into that house forward, forwarded to her cell phone. That way Fawn couldn't get phone calls at the house. Then she put padlocks on the front door and the back door so Fawn couldn't get out. Fawn's family believes she saw things differently. She didn't see it as controlling. She saw it as she cares about me and she wants to protect me. According to the six protection from abuse documents filed by her former partners, Heather had difficulty maintaining healthy boundaries in her relationships. And friends say it was no different with Fawn. She came down with this long hoodie on and the hood was up over her head. And I'm like, can you please take that hood off? So she winds up and she takes her hood down real slow. And then she went like this. And I said, what the? And she said, Heather choked me out. I was like, what do you mean Heather choked you out? She said, Heather come home from the bar one night, was drunker than a skunk. She said, she wound up, covered my hands, covered my feet, turned around, sat on me and took a rope to my neck. She had rope marks coming clear around her neck. She went to the emergency room so many times, she started going to different hospitals because they were asking her too many questions. Eventually, it became harder for Fawn to hide her abuse, so she tried to escape. There were many times that she ran from Heather. 
many times. Fawn had left Heather several times before. Seeking help from Stephanie. Did Fawn always ask you for a ride to her mom's house? Every time. And each time, Heather would be close behind. Heather would always come over, like, pounding on the door, yelling and screaming. It didn't matter what hour of the night it was. Which is why, in 2011, it seemed strange to friends and family when Fawn filed a sudden protection from abuse order against her own mother. Next thing I know, I get a paper in the mail stating that I wasn't supposed to be near even though her and her mom fought, Fawn always ran back to her mom. With her mother's safety net torn apart, Fawn felt completely isolated. Fawn just felt like by then, you know, she didn't talk to anybody for so long. I just don't think she felt like she really had much of anybody. But she was never alone. My bedroom window matched up with her kitchen window. So like I would sit in the bedroom window and she'd sit in the kitchen window and we would talk back and forth because she wasn't allowed to get out of that house. These talks, held in secret, were some of Fawn's last conversations, filled with hope. You know, sometimes she would say, you know, someday I'm going to get out of this. In doubt. She told me before, she said, I feel like I can't, there's nothing I can do. Soon, Heather found a way to end those conversations, too. Heather would have her mom, like, come check on her every once in a while to see what was going on. And her mom pulled in and seen us talking. And then they boarded up those windows. <laughs> By November 2012, Heather and Fawn were no strangers to the law. From protection orders not being followed to violent arguments and even burglary charges. The cops were called there so many times. Despite the protection from abuse orders she had from her daughter, Dorothy's fear for Fawn's safety became too much to bear. My gut instinct said, there's something wrong. Call City Hall. So she called for a welfare check to see if Fawn was okay. Turned around, wound up, and they made the statement, Miss Mountain. We already checked. Your daughter is fine. They made contact with her, and it has been documented in their reports that they did physically see her at her less known address at that point. Reports that Pennsylvania State Police say stopped in November of 2012. It's Monday morning, November 26th. Fawn's neighbors, Stephanie and Mike, get ready to go to the butcher shop, but something feels off. They find Heather, Fawn's girlfriend, outside her trailer smoking a cigarette and talking to her parents. Fawn is nowhere to be seen. I just, I didn't even know Fawn was missing or anything. I just thought it was odd that she wasn't out there too, because usually Heather didn't leave her out of her sight. And I said, you know, well, where's Fawn at? And she said, well, I got up at like three o'clock in the morning to go to the bathroom, she's gone. In the weeks following, friends noticed that Heather's behavior seems oddly calm for Fawn being gone. For six years, anytime that girl would leave her, I mean, she would be losing her mind, going house to house, seeing if anybody seen her or took her anywhere. Or Who leaves at three o'clock in the morning in the middle of winter and doesn't take anything? Did she get tired of it all? Did she leave everything behind or did something more sinister happen? These are the questions that are still left unanswered. I just, I don't believe it. Like, where would she have, first of all, she never went, you know, anywhere without her daughter's urn, you know, and I've seen her leave Heather numerous times, and that's the very first thing she would take and, and get the cops to get. She didn't take any of her clothes. Like, none of her family has heard from her. Do you think that she's alive? I, God, I'm praying to God that she is. I really do miss my sister. Friends say that a week after Fawn went missing, Heather's dad completely remodeled the trailer. They took out the carpet, the floorboards, like the plywood, like that's in a trailer. They took it out, ripped it all out, put, put all new like flooring in and everything. And then the next week she moved to Ohio. As time moved on, Heather came back to Central PA, this time with a new love. And then here two months later, she's back with a new girlfriend that she eventually marries. Perhaps the strangest thing after Fawn went missing was that Heather acted like the disappearance never happened. Fawn's uh, stepdad was in the hospital dying. They were trying to get a hold of Heather. She acted like Fawn went missing and came back and was staying there and it, yeah, was telling her uncle and them that she was there. Heather had told so many people so many different things. Oh, well, I talked to her. She was in a prison in Ohio. She was in New York. She, she went to New York and she's prostituting in New York. I know Greenfield Township did database searches throughout all these states because then there was at one point Arizona. She was supposed to be in Arizona, according to Heather. All of these states, they check the databases and nothing. Three years go by before a missing persons report is filed in 2015. That was another thing people were saying. You know, how could 
How could she be gone that long and not people not know? People also need to understand that she was in an abusive relationship where she was isolated from family and friends. She was not allowed to have family and friends. The case was never sent to state police until 2017. And by then, everyone originally involved had moved on. The initial statements that were taken from them lost. Greenfield Township dropped the ball, big time. This, this could have been investigated way further and more in depth if they would have just taken the time. And now the case is in the hands of state police and they're trying to bring Fawn home. We're still fielding calls from anybody that calls Trooper Martini and she's following up with those calls if anybody has any details that would be important to the investigation. For years, Fawn's family and friends have believed that Heather had something to do with Fawn's disappearance. This is what police had to say. Is Heather a person of interest in this investigation? We do not have a person of interest. While police have hope, they're also realistic. She's still listed as a missing person, but we do suspect that her disappearance is associated with foul play. And all that's left for Fawn's family is hope. I really want to know where she's at. So I can tell her that her dad passed away and mom's not doing so good. We have to find her. 